Good morning. On behalf of the League of Women Voters of Tacoma Pierce County and our co-sponsors, welcome to this forum focusing on candidates for Legislative District 29 uh, with uh, invitations out to candidates for the House Seat 1, House Seat 2, and the Senate. My name is Noel Hagens, and my co-moderator is Brian Lewis, a student at the University of Washington Tacoma. Before we begin the forum, I'd like to give the land acknowledgement. The League of Women Voters of Tacoma Pierce County wishes to acknowledge that we gather on the ancestral lands of the Coast Salish peoples, surrounded by their traditional waters in the shadow of Mount Tahoma. We actively seek inclusive and respectful partnerships that honor indigenous cultures, histories, identities, and current realities. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization that for the past 102 years, has been encouraging the informed and active participation of citizens in government. Candidate forums are one of the many ways we do this. The League also influences public policy through education and advocacy. The League is open to any person age 16 or older who subscribes to the purpose and policy of the League, including men as well as women. For information on membership, go to our website, lwbtpc.org. Candidate forums provide an opportunity for the public to compare and contrast candidates before voting in the general election. All candidates were invited to this forum. Brian, you're muted. Brian. Thank you. The candidates with us this morning um, our Steve Conway, candidate for the Senate, who is having technical issues but may join later. Uh, Terry Harder, also a candidate for Senate. Uh, Brett Johnson, candidate for House of Representatives, seat number one, who is not present uh, but may join later. Charlotte Mena, candidate for House of Representatives, seat number two. David Figuration, candidate for House of Representatives, seat two. Uh, and Melanie Morgan, who is running for seat number one and had another commitment, uh, who is not present. This year's general election is November 8th. Ballots will be mailed out on Friday, October 21st if you are a registered voter. Uh, if you are not yet registered or have moved, you may register at vote.wa.gov by October 31st. Your ballot must be postmarked or placed in a ballot drop box by 8 p.m. November 8th. This forum is being recorded and will be posted at the League of Women Voters Tacoma Pierce County website, LWV tpc.org. Questions have been prepared by the League of Women Voters and our co-sponsoring organizations. Uh, we invite live audience questions via text. Uh, questions must be directed to all candidates and may be rewarded or consolidated. Uh, our timekeeper today is Terry Baker of the League of Women Voters. She will hold up cards to let candidates know when they have 60 seconds remaining, 30 seconds, 15, and when it's time to stop. When you see the stop card, you may finish a short sentence. The candidates have been given ground rules in advance, which include among other provisions that they will adhere to the rules of common courtesy and will not comment on other candidates, but will focus on the issues and that there will be no other recordings made of this forum. Could you candidates please confirm that you agree to these rules? You can confirm by a nod or a heads up. Thank you. In the audience, if you have questions for the candidates, as you have, as you have just heard, but to repeat, you may text them to 253-861-6824. Candidates will be timed as they answer and may finish their sentences if they receive the signal to end. Uh, but David, uh, Brian spoke about that. Uh, the opportunity for candidates to answer questions first will rotate and the closing statements will be given in the opposite order that they were, that uh, candidates uh, made their opening statements. Candidates, be sure to keep your, sc your screen on gallery view so you can see the timekeeper. You'll have 90 seconds for each question. Please do not talk unless it's your turn to please mute yourselves when it's not your turn to speak. The audience is on mute and cannot use the chat function. 
Opening statements will be given in ballot order. Each candidate may speak for up to two minutes. Uh, and Steve Conway does not seem to be here. So we'll move to Terry Harder for your opening statement, please, Terry. Well, thank you very much. Uh, are you better off today than you were four years ago? Crime is up dramatically and the cost of living is way up and the schools are failing our children. Ever since the anti-policing bills passed, crime has spiked dramatically and folks say the police have their hands tied with these new laws. The majority party leadership ran out the clock on a fix for some of the problems caused by those laws. Law enforcement desperately needs a fix to these laws. With the cost of everything going up, the majority party decided to spend all $15 billion of the surplus with no tax relief, even during the pandemic. They even rejected the sales tax removal from diapers. The gas tax will be going up in January by 46 cents and by $1 a gallon total by 2023. When there is no tax relief, it hurts those who can least afford it, working families. Right now, 70% of Washington students statewide are failing math and over 50% are failing reading. Those are truly awful numbers. We can't continue down this path of high failure. The 29th district deserves bold solutions. We need educational choice that includes career and technical education, actively supporting innovation and accountability. Families deserve better education policies so our next generation can be successful. Again, I ask, are you better off today than you were four years ago? Crime is up dramatically and the cost of living is way up and the schools are failing our children. Unless we change who we elect in November, we can expect more of the same. So I ask for your support and for your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Uh, next, Charlotte Mena for your opening statement, please. Thank you so much, Noel, and thank you guys for hosting this forum and inviting us here. I'm super impressed to see Brian, who's a student, <laughs> out here dedicating his Saturday morning. I think probably when I was in school, I wasn't dedicating myself to anything but sleeping in on Saturdays. So I appreciate that. As you all know, my name is Charlotte Mena. I'm a public servant, a community organizer, and the very proud daughter of Mexican immigrants. And my parents you know, worked to put food on the table, doing farm work uh, and cutting meat at the IBP plant. Um, and, you know, from them, I really learned these values of public service and, and showing up for our community. Um, after becoming the first person in my family to graduate from college, I started a career in public service out in Washington, D.C., and I bring with me to this race a decade of experience at the federal and state level uh, working on policies that help working families. I also serve on several boards, including Fuse Washington, the South Tacoma Neighborhood Council, uh, and previously on the board of Plant Parenthood. But outside of the office, I've been working for several years to bring more folks in the 29th into the civic process. Um, we are a minority majority district uh, and we have the lowest voter turnout of any district in the state. And I think that's a problem because what that means for us is that you know, folks that are struggling to afford childcare, folks that are dealing with air pollution and water pollution, folks that are making tough decisions at the grocery store are being left out. What it really means is that folks that are at the center of the problems are the furthest from power. So I've been working to change that. I've been running a people powered movement so that we can actually lead with the values that we hold in this district so that we can work on the housing and homelessness crisis with empathy so that we can work on keeping our community safe without rolling back critical protections um, with you know, these law enforcement reforms. And so I'm you know, really excited, um, really proud to have gotten endorsements from labor unions, you know, including the Teamsters to the Fraternal Order of Police and various community groups. And I'm really excited to take your questions today and thank you for having me. Thank you, Charlotte. And David Figuration for your opening statement, please. There we go. I, I want to thank uh, the League of Women Voters for having this forum. I appreciate the opportunity to come out and share my ideas with your group and the uh, wider audience. Uh, I am a 60 year resident of Pierce County. This is not a career move for me. I've been a nurse for the last 27 years. I've seen how COVID has affected our healthcare system. I have a unique perspective on the drug and alcohol problem 
in Pierce County because I am a recovering addict and alcoholic. As a Pierce County resident, I've seen the changes that have taken place over the last five years and they continue to throw money at problems that don't solve them. So we need to look at some accountability on where that money is going. We need tax relief for working families. I support the uh, initiative to limit the first $250,000 of your assessed value from property taxes. We need school choice. We need a bold new look at problems. We don't need the same old thing we've been getting for the last 20 years with one party rule in Olympia. It's time for a change and I'm here to make that change. Thank you. Thank you, David. Now let's begin with the questions. Each candidate will have 60 seconds to answer. And we'll begin with uh, the first question, please, Brian. Confirm 60 or 90. Oh, did I say 60? Yeah. I meant 90. Thank you, Terry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the state's tax structure remains the most regressive in the country. What measures would you support to make the structure more equitable and less regressive? And for this, we'll start with David Figuration. Well, I would start with uh, lowering the sales tax and also lowering property taxes. I am opposed to an income tax basically because it's in our constitution. Um, the problem in Washington has never been funding. It's always been spending. As uh, someone mentioned earlier, they had a $15 billion budget surplus and they spent it all and they still raise taxes and fees. So what we need to do is we need to look at where that money is going and how we're spending it. And we need to spend it better. As I said earlier, it's never been a problem with funding. It's always been a spending problem. And that's where I would focus on how to make things more equitable. Because if we give people a tax break, we lower the gas tax, we lower the sales tax, we lower the property tax, working families will reap the benefits. Um, second of all, I, I think that we need to look at how we fund all of our programs and what we can do different to make that more equitable for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And Terry Harder. I thank you. Yes, uh, uh, I would voice the same thing that uh, David just did, that we need to lower taxes, uh, our sales tax, our property tax, the first $250,000 should be exempt. Uh, that'll help working families quite a bit. Uh, but I think we need to take a new approach. We, we need to look outside the box. There are two things that would help everybody. And that would be zero-based budgeting. And you do that by every two years during an election year, you set every agency to zero and make them give you a budget proposal and either approve that budget or deny that budget based upon their needs, their real needs. And restart the state productivity board so that uh, the state workers will typically have the ability to get uh, a bonus for either finding savings or efficiencies. And I think that would go a long ways to help him because in those election years, every candidate and every office holder would be looking for savings and raise their hand and say, look what I found. We would have competition for savings instead of competition for money. Thank you. Thank you. And Charlotte Mena. Brian, can I ask you to repeat the question? Is that okay? Absolutely. Uh, the state's tax structure remains the most regressive in the country. What measures would you support to make the structure more equitable and less regressive? Yeah, I, I really appreciate that question because Washington's tax structure does remain the most regressive in the country, which essentially means that those that can least afford it uh, with the lowest incomes are paying the most, a higher percentage of their income. Um, you know, I think there's a lot we can do. Uh, first and foremost, I support the capital gains tax, and I think that we need to make sure that that gets implemented. There's an estimate from the Department of Revenue that shows this would affect less than one quarter of 1% 1 
of Washingtonians and what that means in the 29th, where we are very much a working class district, is potentially only 19 people in the entire 29th, which is a, a district of about 160,000, would be subjected to this. Um, we have to find revenue uh, to fund these critical programs. We have a lot of crises before us. We have a housing and homelessness crisis. We've got an affordability crisis. And so we have to look at these measures that don't overburden working folks that are already overburdened. So that's step one. Um, the working family tax credit that came out and put money back into the pockets of working families is really great. I would love to continue supporting measures like that. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, uh, this, this is a, another uh, revenue question. I think you've covered this, but it may have additional thoughts. If additional revenue is generated beyond what's been budgeted, what use of the funds would you advocate? And we'll start with uh, Terry Harder, please. Well, thank you. Uh, I believe that all surpluses uh, should be um, looking at the possible budget shortfalls for the next biennium. And if there will not be a budget shortfall, we need to give it back to the taxpayers because the taxpayers gave that. That is their money, not the state's, even though the state has collected it. So I would say that uh, savings in uh, property tax for sales tax, you know, all those little taxes that the working families pay the most of need to be refunded and don't spend that money if you don't need it. That's simple. Thank you, Terry. Uh, next, Charlotte Mena, please. Thank you. Yeah, so I think, you know, the, the state's rainy day fund is, is pretty well supplied, but I think we check and make sure that we're prepared to meet emergencies. Um, and then I think we, do some participatory budgeting, right? We should come to our communities and ask what it is that they need and what it is that they want spending on. I've been knocking on doors since December. Uh, what I hear from folks is they're really concerned about the housing crisis. They're really concerned about their neighbors. They're concerned about what they're seeing. You know, they've also been concerned about the increase in crime and the low staffing numbers that we have with local police departments, which it's a really complicated. Um, I think we continue to fund those things that our communities are asking for and try to meet those needs as best as possible as their state government. Thank you, Charlotte. And now David Figuration, please. If I would say if the state has a, a budget surplus, I'm with Terry Harder. That money should be refunded to the taxpayers. As Terry said, it's their money. It's not the state's money. Um, and we need to give that money back to the people and, and let them decide how to spend it. Uh, you know, buying groceries, buying gas, um, the things they need. Um, so that's, that's the end of that story. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. And then the next question, uh, please describe a circumstance where you've worked across the aisle on an issue or where you would expect to. And we'll start this with uh, Charlotte Mena. Thank you so much for that question. So as I mentioned, I've worked in federal and state government for 10 years um, and have a lot of experience working across the aisle. Uh, as a staffer for Governor Inslee in Washington, DC, doing federal affairs for the state of Washington, uh, I helped steward a bill through Congress to help with salmon recovery that ultimately got a yes vote from all 12 members of the Washington state delegation from both sides of the aisle. Um, I'm probably most proud of the work I did in the state Senate, um, working on what we called the access to democracy bills, which created same day voter registration, automatic voter registration, and the Washington Voting Rights Act. The Washington Voting Rights Act was probably the most difficult and one of, one of the bills I was the most proud to work on as a staffer, because essentially it creates a more representative democracy in Washington state, and that took a lot of you know, sitting across the table from folks who disagreed, the Association of Washington Counties, the Association of Washington Cities, the Advocates, One America. So, you know, as a, as a person who works in state government, a person who works at the Department of Ecology that is often at the intersection of industry, environment, community, and state government, I have a lot of experience working with folks to find common ground. And that's what I'm excited to take with me to Olympia. Thank you. Uh, David Figuration. 
Well, I don't have any experience in, uh, in government. My experience has been in, in working with people on a daily basis. I'm a nurse. Uh, I was a director of nursing for an assisted living facility. I have managed staff of up to 50 people and I have worked with them to design a system that works for both management and employees. I've worked with families, negotiating service plans. Um, one of the things that I found really interesting was that uh, it was on the uh, Democratic State uh, website. They consider bipartisan passage of a bill is if they can get one person from the other party to agree with the bill. I would, I would like to see more bipartisan work where we had you know, an equal number of people agreeing with the bill and getting, getting things done, um, not just on party lines, but what really helps the everyday taxpayer in Washington. Thank you. Thank you. And Terry Harder. Well, thank you for that question. Um, I find it interesting that the habit of both parties has been to verbally punch each other in the nose and expect the other side to come to an agreement. That doesn't work. God gave us one mouth and two ears. We simply need to listen twice as much as we talk and persuade, not demean. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. It's currently the policy of Washington State to promote access to affordable, high quality, sexual and reproductive health care, including abortion care without unnecessary burdens or restrictions on patients or providers. Please describe your position on these protections and whether you would vote to change them or not. And we'll begin with Charlotte Mena, please. Yeah, I appreciate the question. It's obviously very timely, and I'm really proud that we have laws on the books in Washington state passed through ballot initiative to protect the right to abortion and sexual and reproductive freedom. As a legislator, I would support that as well as reproductive justice, which essentially means extending that access to folks um, who don't normally have access, right? We know that this continues to affect folks in the immigrant community, uh, communities of color and low income communities. So as a legislator, I would work to preserve that right. I think we need to bolster it uh, in Washington state um, and make sure that we're prepared to meet the growing demand that's coming from other states and folks that are in crisis. So that's my position and that's what I'll be carrying in the legislature. Thank you, Charlotte. Uh, next, Terry Harder, please. Uh, yes, uh, obviously if I were elected, uh, we swear an oath to obey the laws and protect the laws of the Constitution of Washington and of uh, uh, the United States government. Uh, my position personally is entirely different. My religion teaches me that life begins at conception. In fact, Pope John Paul II uh, said that human life must be respected and protected absolutely from the moment of conception, from the first moment of existence a human being must be recognized as having the rights of a person, among which is the inviolable right of every innocent being to life. So that's my personal position. But again, you know, Washington has voted twice on abortion, and that is the law. And I don't see that coming up because it, it is not a winnable uh, a winnable law in this state, since so many folks in the last uh, election overwhelmingly voted for abortion. Thank you, Terry. And David Figuration, please. Um, I, I would echo what Terry had said. Uh, Washington State uh, voted to have abortion in the state before the Roe versus Wade decision. So nothing the Supreme Court did changed anything in Washington. That was passed by an initiative process. I would oppose any bills in, in the House to change that initiative process as long as the people of the state vote in a true democracy that they want to have that in, in law, then I will support that. My personal view is, is that abortion should be rare and it should only be used if the mother's 
life is in danger or in case of rape and incest. It shouldn't be a form of birth control. I would oppose any, any legislation that, that involved a third trimester abortion. Um, you know, it's in our constitution, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And so again, people have the right to choose and people should be able to choose. And so I know that's kind of convoluted, but the, uh, it, it's already lost. So nothing changed in Washington. And I don't, I, I don't see it changing any time in the future. Thank you, David. Thank you. Uh, Washington State's election system of vote by mail and segregation of voting databases and other systems have created election security that has not to date been breached. Additionally, ballot processing can be observed by the public through political parties and or the League of Women Voters to validate this. Uh, what additional measures, if any, do you believe are necessary for voters of Washington State to be confident that election outcomes will be fair and accurate? And we will start with uh, Terry Harder. I think they're very fair and uh, accurate right now in Pierce County. Uh, we have traditionally had a Republican Secretary of State, and I think they've done a fairly decent job uh, of protecting uh, the, the process. In fact, uh, Charlotte and I even saw uh, one of the uh, uh, recounts done at, at the last election, and I think it was very fair. So I don't see any changes right now. Of course, I'd be... Uh, uh, up to listening to anything that would make it more secure. Thank you. Thank you, David Figuration. Um, you know, we've got mail-in ballots and, and that's, it's very simple for people. I, I, I agree with Charlotte. What we need to do is we need to get more people involved. In the last primary election, only 33% of the ballots that went out came back. And, and that means a third of the people are choosing the leaders for all of us. So I would like to find a way that we could increase voter turnout and, and mail-in voter, mail-in ballots do that. As far as security, um, you know, I, I, I wanna make sure that we don't have any ballot harvesting. Uh, and I know that's in the law. Um, I, I grew up in a time when we had in-person voting. And, it, you know, it was a day that people went out and voted. There's t conversations out there now about making election day a holiday, a state of holiday. I don't know that we need that as long as we're doing mail-in ballots. Um, one of the things that kind of makes me concerned is why if, if the county, uh, uh, the county uh, medical examiner's office has to certify deaths why they can't give that information right to the auditor's office and have those names removed. So I, I'd like to see us do a better job of keeping track of the voter rolls. Thank you. Thank you. And Charlotte Mena. Thank you. Yeah, I, I wouldn't disagree with what's been said. I think we have an incredibly secure election system. In fact, uh, you know, the House of Representatives out in DC did a congressional report on, on safest election systems. This was probably in 2017, and I know it's out there, but Washington actually ranks among the top, and it's because of our mail-in voting. So when you ask, you know, what can we do to make our election system safer or create more confidence, I think it's maybe education. And I, I think the work that you all do here in educating the voters is incredible. Um, as Terry mentioned, in 2020, we got to go see a recount and just visiting the Pierce County Auditor's Office and seeing the process is very eye-opening and certainly does foster confidence. Um, but I would echo also what's been shared, right? This is not an issue of election security. It's an issue of turnout. And I think, you know, it behooves us to continue doing that work of enfranchising voters and going to get folks that maybe feel disillusioned or feel disconnected or have been historically disenfranchised and, you know, offering them an on-ramp into the process. Thank you. Thank, thank you. What is, what is an issue that is unique to the people of the 29th district and how do you plan to tackle that issue in the legislature? And we'll start with David Figuration, please. Well, I would say it's crime. Crime is out of control in Pierce County. We are going on a record number of murders uh, and 
So I would want to look at what legislation was put in place on the last couple of legislative sessions. I think another thing we need to do is we need to stop demonizing the police. Uh, you know, people go out there and, and they, they treat them like they're just a bunch of bloodthirsty racists and all they want to do is go out and, and hurt people of color, which is not true. I have been endorsed by the uh, Tacoma Police Department Union. I am a strong supporter of law enforcement. The, the chief at Tacoma Police said that 10% of the people are creating 40% of the crime. If we could get that 10% off the street, we would reduce crime for almost 40%. We have to end, the, end that revolving door. If you do the crime, you got to pay the time. That's the end of my statement. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, Terry Harder, you're next, please. Yes, uh, as I've been doorbelling, uh, crime has been the one thing that it stands out. And most people in the neighborhoods feel that uh, when they call in, they don't get a uh, quick reaction. And when they do, the police typically have their hands tied and can't do anything. And uh, the neighborhoods that I have visited in Doorbell, uh, almost 90% uh, plus say that crime is just out of control and they're very upset by it. I've had the unique position to be able to do a ride along with two different police departments. And uh, I wanted to make sure that I understood what that was all about. You know, when, when people talk about that, they actually echo the same thing. They feel terrible that they can't go and do their job because their hands are tied by those laws. But one of the things that really impressed me is they are truly peace officers. When I had the opportunity to go with them, they handled a mentally ill person very professionally. They handled a domestic dispute very professionally. This little boy was so upset when they were dealing with that domestic dispute that officer walked him over to the, the car, let him play with the car, gave him a sticker and made him an honorary police officer. And it was just really heart rendering. What a good job he did as a police officer. Thank That's you, Terry. Thank you so much. And Charlotte Mena, please. Okay. Thank you. So I do wanna talk about an issue that I think is more unique to the 29th, but since crime has come up, I wanna address that first. And um, yeah, I think, you know, this is actually an issue that's pretty prevalent across the state and across the country. So we've seen an uptick in violent crime all over these United States. Um, and I think what we have to do is continue to walk the line of ensuring that our communities are safe and protected while maintaining accountability. And what I mean by that is when we entrust people uh, to be able to carry firearms in our community to do this important work, we have to have great accountability with that, right? Like with great responsibility comes, <laughs> comes great accountability. And I think we can do both. So I'm happy to share the list of laws that were passed by the legislature. I was not there at the time, but they include things such as independent investigations when something goes awry, certainly not a hand tying exercise um, and certainly something that we need to maintain in a community that is majority minority. But I wanna to transition to something that I think is pretty, pretty unique to the 29th and other low income communities, which is environmental health disparities. Uh, we have pretty poor air and water quality. This is something I, I'm really nerdy about and get really into because I work in this environmental sphere. But essentially you can see that because of the poor air quality and because of where we live, we are more susceptible to things like COVID and the compounding effects that come from that. So I wanna work on making sure that we have healthy air and water and healthy communities. Thank you, Charlotte. There's a possible nationwide recession looming and recessions typically bring job loss. What strategies and plans do you have to ensure citizens in your district and Washington state will continue to have access to family wage jobs? And for this, we'll start with Terry Harder. Well, of course, uh, tax reduction is probably the best way to give incentives to businesses. Uh, they're the ones, the small businesses are the ones that really provide most jobs in Pierce County, and in fact, for the whole state. We need to make sure that they have the incentive to hire people and continue to prosper by giving them uh, less to deal with, with regulations and lower taxes. 
and of course, encouraging people to uh, accept jobs that maybe uh, they have to go back to a technical college for in order to, to get. Uh, there's just a lot of solutions that involve uh, businesses doing their part by giving those businesses incentives. Thank you. Thank you. And Charlotte Mena. So we have a lot of investment coming our way. You know, the state has passed a lot of environmental laws to, you know, incentivize the development of clean energy. We've got a lot of housing units that we need to build. Um, and we have federal investments that came out of the Congress with the Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. So we have all this taxpayer money that has already been appropriated and is floating around. And I want that in the 29th. I want to, you know, prepare our small businesses for grants. I want to prepare our workers to receive this money and get to work building bridges and houses and culvert removal and all of the things that are going to bring good union wage jobs to the district. And I want to ensure that they create good union wage jobs by marrying it with workforce standards. So I'll be looking for opportunities to bring that free money into the 29th to make sure that we have jobs here locally that don't require people to commute uh, and to make sure that the state matching dollars that are necessary or there and that we can get people to work right here at home. Thank you. And David Figuration? Can you repeat the question? Absolutely. Uh, there is a possible nationwide recession looming and recessions typically bring job loss. What strategies and plans do you have to ensure citizens in your district and in Washington state will continue to have access to family wage jobs? Well, I, I would uh, I would reiterate what Terry says. Regulations need to be drawn back, um, and we need to look at eighty six percent of the state's GDP comes from small businesses. So we need to find out ways to help small business to meet those needs with less regulations. Um, you know, we came up with this idea that the uh, the minimum wage is supposed to be a living wage. Um, my feeling is, is the minimum wage was never designed to be a living wage. It was a place to start, not a place to finish. We, we've seen exponential growth in wages in Washington state, which have increased price on everything. We, we need to look at a holistic approach to our, our energy needs, um, how we're going to meet this coming challenge and keep people employed. Thank you. Thank you. Housing costs in Pierce County have rapidly increased over the past couple of years. If you're elected to the legislature, what plans do you have to make sure that residents of the 29th Legislative District are able to find affordable homes while also ensuring existing communities are not displaced. And we'll begin with Charlotte Mena, please. I appreciate the question. I, I hear about housing quite frequently and it is top of mind for everybody in the region. Uh, I think it's worth noting that the 29th has a lower median income uh, than the neighboring districts in the 28th and 27th, but we're competing in the same housing market. So I think one thing the legislature has been doing right is providing resources for folks uh, to make sure that they can keep their homes and sort of stem the homelessness crisis by being proactive. I think we need to do that. We need to continue working on tenant protections right now after having just cause evictions passed in the legislature. We're seeing what are called economic evictions where people raise the rent uh, and then folks have basically 20 days to meet that demand or move out. I think that's an immediate thing that we can do and address. I think we can continue to fund the pot of money that provides legal resources for folks facing eviction. And then functionally, I think we need to build more housing, right? I think we need more units uh, so that we can sort of start to bring those costs down and make sure that folks have a place to go. Uh, there's a lot the legislature can do to incentivize that. We've got to work on zoning and construction. Uh, and I think we can put people to work right here at home with good union wage jobs, building affordable housing and other types of housing. So that's what I'd like to support. Thank you. David Figuration, please. Um, according to the uh, Realtors Association, 40% of new construction is taken up by regulations. We need to cut the regulations so we can build more affordable housing. 
I mean, at 40% of the cost of a new construction is regulation. If we can cut that back by just 20%, it's going to make housing more affordable. Um, we need to uh, look at what housing is available. You know, we keep hearing about all of these, uh, you know, I just saw an article the other day that they're going to convert a Motel 6 into affordable housing and the uh, rent is going to be $1,000 a month. That's not affordable as far as I'm concerned, not for a hotel room. Um, we need to de-emphasize being homeless. We need to hold people accountable. Uh, the housing crisis is, is, is so multifaceted, but the answer is not just throwing money at it. It's gotta be looking at the taxes and the regulations and making it easier for the private sector to get out there and actually build things that are affordable. Thank you. Thank you. And Terry Harder, please. Well, thank you for that question. Uh, one of the, as I was talking to uh, uh, one of the uh, folks that is in construction uh, and with the uh, uh, Association of uh, Washington Business, they both concurred that uh, regulation is a, a very large factor, but the permitting process uh, causes a delay in building uh, residences by as much as a year. It takes a physical, uh, physically six months to build a house from beginning to end. But with the permitting process and all the things and all the hoops they have to jump through, it can take two years. So that delays getting homes on the market and the availability of buildable land is also a, a big factor in the cost of housing. And I just think we need to take a, a holistic approach and see exactly what costs it takes to build a home and see what we can do to reduce that. And we need to talk to both sides. We need to come to agreement for what works for Washington, not what works for one party or the other. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Given the possibility of a recession and the revenue shortfall that is currently projected, what spending would you prioritize and what would you cut? And we will start with David Figuration. Um, I would prioritize education, um, law enforcement, uh, <laughs> transportation. I would cut the, the, oh, and mental health, that's the other one. Um, but we, we need to cut some of the fluff out of the budget, you know, uh, things that don't make sense, studies on the fruit fly. And I, I, I think that there's a lot of things in the state budget. The state budget has doubled in the last 10 years, and the population of the state has only gone up about 10%. So I think there's lots of room in the budget to cut it back and, and meet any shortfalls that might come about. I, we, we should have done that already. They had the, the $15 billion surplus. If they thought they were coming up with a shortfall, why didn't we put that in the rainy day fund instead of spending it all? That's the other thing we've got to look at is how we're spending and, and, and looking forward. And I, I would reiterate what Terry had said before about going to zero budgeting planned instead of the, the way we do it now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Terry Harder? Yes, uh, the priority should always be public safety. And after public safety, then of course schools is a major priority and we need to fully fund schools uh, as mandated uh, by our legislation. Uh, Zero-based budgeting would work. In fact, is uh, the, the person that came up with that uh, solution was actually two different people, Gary Locke and Dina Rossi. They came up with a zero-based budgeting in tandem with the State Productivity Board. And I think that's a smart, outside of the box uh, approach to budgeting. And it will save considerably because there are so many times when agencies see that they have extra money in their budget and budget is coming up, they spend that money so they won't get less the next time. I have actually experienced that when I worked for 
a, a company and was selling office supplies and furniture. And I, I, can, I can truly say that when there's an incentive to save versus an incentive to spend, we would save a considerable amount. And zero-based budgeting can't just be done random. It has to uh, be done so that we can eventually get to the entire budget. And that would be one quarter every two years and do that at an election year. So everyone is looking at it, both candidates and those that are in office. Thank you. Thank you and Charlotte Minna. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, so I think first and foremost, we have to protect essential services. And those are you know, essentially what are fulfilling people's basic needs. And we went through this recently with the COVID-19 pandemic and you know, sort of headed toward recession. And we had a lot of widespread panic because of these austerity cuts that were being proposed. But outside of that, I think we really need to look at new sources of generating revenue that are actually progressive uh, and begin to stem this sort of problem. Outside of that, I think it's a, an exercise in triaging, right? All of the priorities that we've passed um, that we're spending dollars on have been approved by representatives of the people across 49 legislative districts. But what I think we can do is start to prioritize and say, what is necessary to do tomorrow and what can wait until next year? Um, I think if, you know, if we end up in a situation where we do have to make adjustments and tighten our belts in certain areas, you know, I would take the same approach that I've taken to this campaign and that I've mentioned before, which is really come alongside people, have listening sessions in the 29th, work with community leaders that represent their communities and figure out what are the things that we want to make sure are do not touch programs and what are the things that we can push off. Um, I really, truly believe in movement governing and wouldn't like to make these decisions without you know, community engagement. Thank you. As a legislator, you, rep you represent the interests or you will represent the interests of your district, but you also are responsible for decisions that affect citizens statewide. How will you balance those responsibilities when they conflict? And we'll start with David Figuration, please. Can, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question again? As a legislator, uh, you would be uh, represent the interests of your district, but you're also responsible for decisions that affect citizens statewide. How will you balance those responsibilities when they conflict? Okay, thank you for the question. Um, you know, that, that, that comes back to the whole thing. We, we have to look at how we're doing things and do the do the does the legislation actually help the people you know and one of the things i've noticed in my 60 years in the state of washington is that the legislature passes a bunch of bills at the beginning of the session and then waits for the budget at the end i think we need to look at budget day one and 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 when we look at budget we need to say, okay, we're going to spend this money and how is it going to help people instead of like Terry had said before, how is it going to help my party or how is it going to help the other party? Um, and, and, and again, we, we aren't just representing the 29th. We do our, our what we what we do here affects people in in the Okanagan and in uh, Ritzville and everywhere else. And so we have to look at how those policies that might not float in a district like the 29 would work in Ritzville or the other way around. And so I would look at all of that, travel the state, talk to people, and like I said, really make the legislative priorities that help people and not parties. Thank, Thank you, you, David. Thank you, David. Uh, Terry Harder next, please. Why, thank you. Uh, I think that as the representative of the 29th district, I would definitely consider the 29th needs first. However, you can't uh, ignore the greater good of Washington state. I mean, the reason that uh, I would be there is because I was uh, elected to represent our district first. But again, uh, it, it has to be a balance and you, you have to look uh, at all things. When I make decisions, 
uh, there's an old rule that I've used is called the Ben Franklin close. Put all the good things on one side and all the bad things on another. And if there are more good than bad, that's a good decision. And that's exactly how we would balance it between the 29th and Washington state. What's better for 29th or what's better for Washington state? If they're equal, great. Uh, if there are unequal and the 29th suffers, I'm going to be representing the 29th district more. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. And Charlotte Meta, please. Well, I appreciate you asking the hard questions. <laughs> this, this one's a little, a little dicey, but it's the realities of being a legislator, right? And so I would say, you know, first and foremost, the needs of the district have to have to take precedence. Um, and that's the reason that, you know, you would be elected to represent this district. I think it is the job of a legislator in the 29th to try to get the best possible outcome for the residents here, uh, working in collaboration and in conjunction with representatives from the others. I think, you know, as a, as a district that has a low voter turnout, as a district that is more low income, working class, blue collar, we have not always had the most vocal seat at the table. And so it is incumbent upon us to make those cases and try to get as far along as possible. But, you know, these are the realities, the policies that get made affect everyone across the state. So certainly those are considerations while we prioritize the residents of, of this district. Um, I think equally challenging is there are times that the district itself is split on issues, right? Like there may be something coming before the legislature where various folks who live in the 29th have different opinions. And I think, you know, it is the job of a leader to sort of make those tough decisions uh, that will benefit people, protect our rights, um, and really move the ball forward. And that's my philosophy. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you. Uh, if you are elected to office, part of your job in 2023 will be adopting the biennial budget. What experience do you have with preparing or analyzing and adopting a budget? And we will start with Terry Harder. In my job uh, in a business to business sales uh, position, uh, I was given uh, many budgets by many different people, including uh, some of the uh, the largest budgets uh, in the region for office supplies. And I would look at each individual needs and ask them uh, exactly what it was they needed to have uh, and uh, find the budget that fit that the most. I dealt with uh, millions of dollars of office supply uh, budgets uh, on an annual basis and worked those contracts. So I'm very experienced at working with people finding solutions that fit and making sure that they get what they need for their dollar. Thank you. Charlotte Mena. Yeah, I have a lot of direct experience working with the state budget itself uh, and working within an agency to sort of figure out what we need and how we get that to the legislature and how we get that through the legislature. I also have experience with the federal budget and understand how these things interplay as well as how they interplay with local budget. So I feel very prepared to hit the ground running. I understand how these things work. I understand where the niches are for us to be able to seek funding for the district within the operating budget as well as the capital budget and the transportation budget. So you know, having that experience as well as pre-existing relationships in the legislature, I think equips me to get there and be a great advocate for the 29th on day one. Thank you. And David Figuration. Well, like uh, the majority of people in the 29th district, I, uh, I have experience in a household budget. And I know in the household budget, you, you have a certain amount of money coming in and you got a certain amount of money going out and you can't spend money. You don't have. And unfortunately, I think the state has been spending money we don't have, or we shouldn't have because we're taking it from the taxpayers. Also, as a director of nursing in assisted living, I had to manage a labor budget. I had to manage uh, uh, the labor budget and the, the food budget and, and those sorts of things. So I do have some experience there. I do not, and I'll be honest with you, I don't have a, a uh, any uh, experience with a $2 billion budget. So I will have to have a learning curve there, but I'm going to come at it from the point of the working man and how individuals in the state of, in the 29th district try to make their own budget work. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Entrepreneurship 
and successful local business are vital to thriving communities. Do you have any experience with economic development? And how would you ensure that all communities in Washington state are places where entrepreneurs can start and grow businesses? And we'll start with Charlotte, please. Yeah, thank you for that question. I mean, small businesses are the backbone of our economy. They're the largest employer in Washington state. I'm not an entre entrepreneur myself, but I have been the small business liaison for the Department of Ecology for several years. And so what that means is I'm the first point of contact for small business owners that may have questions about uh, compliance or regulation or how to get through these processes as quickly and efficiently as possible. And our you know, stated goal at the Department of Ecology was it has been to have a you know, economy and an environment that are in harmony with each other. And so, you know, having that experience and having worked in, in state government, understanding how we support our small businesses through technical assistance, through grants and availability, through connection points such as the Office of Minority and Women-Owned Business Enterprises. So I hope to, you know, continue to coalesce with local business owners like we do at the South Tacoma Neighborhood Council when we hear about their needs uh, and definitely work to meet those as a state legislator. Thank you. David Figuration, please. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question again? Yes, certainly. Entrepreneurship and successful local business are vital to thriving communities. Do you have any experience with economic development and how would you ensure that all communities in Washington state are places where entrepreneurs can start and grow businesses? Well, again, my, my experience is at working in the assisted living where we had to uh, compete with several other companies and, and make our business competitive with other uh, assisted living. Things. Um, what we need to do for entrepreneurs and for small businesses is again cut the regulations, give them an opportunity to thrive in, in an environment where they can do their jobs and not have to spend a lot of money on regulations from the state. Um, small businesses and, and entrepreneurs don't want government handouts, they don't want they want to just be able to do their jobs. And it should be the job of the legislature to encourage um, investments and encourage people to create jobs and create businesses, not discourage them. And I think we've been in an environment where the regulations discourage that sort of thing, and we need to change that. Thank you. Thank you. And Terry Harder, please. Yes, I've been a small business consultant for uh, U.S. Bank and for Office Depot, and I've consulted many small businesses and have heard a lot of their concerns. Most businesses, they just know that they want to make money and they want to employ people and, and they want to enjoy that American dream of having a small business and owning a home and all of that. They don't typically understand regulations. They typically don't understand tax impacts. There are a lot of things. I think education for small business owners is very, very important. And also an incentive to invest in small businesses with low cost loans, incentivize banks through a, a, a system that they had years ago where the state would invest a portion and the business owner would invest a portion in a CD for an investment to help their business. And they could borrow against that for their working capital. There are just so many things that small businesses need. I think the very biggest thing that the state can do is have a position of assisting rather than regulations that have a tendency to make them feel like nobody cares. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. Uh, homelessness continues to be a growing issue in the 29th district and Washington state. What strategies do you have to handle this issue and take care of our most vulnerable citizens? And we'll start with David Figuration. A huge part of the homeless crisis right now is the drug problem. We need to do something about drugs in the state of Washington. As I said earlier, I have a unique experience 
with uh, drug addiction and alcoholism. I've been in recovery for over 29 years. And I know that if you just walk up to somebody that has a problem with drug or alcoholism and ask them if they want to get better, they're going to tell you no. There has to be an incentive to get better. And sometimes that incentive for me was I either go to treatment or I go to jail. I'm not saying we illegalize that we illegalize homelessness. What I'm saying is we look at how we're treating the homeless. We need to stop encouraging it. Recently, the state of the, the, the city of Tacoma passed a resolution to say that there couldn't be homeless camps within a 10 block radius of a homeless shelter because it wasn't safe and it wasn't healthy. Well, why, if that's true for areas around um, homeless shelters, why is that not true for the whole county? We, we have to look at what is causing this and where is it coming from? There, there's the housing shortage. I believe a lot of this is people have been uh, priced out of the workforce. Um, and, and the other thing is, is we have to make sure that the money we are allocating to the homeless go to the homeless. Thank you. And Terry Harder. Well, thank you for that question. Uh, I would echo some of uh, what David said. Uh, we, we need to uh, take a look at uh, homelessness from the aspect of who is there and how can we help. Um, we can't continue to just give a handout. We've got to look at giving a hand up, treating the alcoholism and addiction when we find it, treating the mental illness when they find it. So how do we do that? Uh, it, it's a, a, a tough situation because, you know, we, we have quit um, going after people for the small crimes so they don't get into the system. And we continuously allow folks in properties they shouldn't be. Uh, we need to get a little bit more of our social services out in the area because quite frankly, it's not compassionate to let folks go without some kind of help, but at the same token, to let them continue without addressing those issues, without addressing uh, the, the, oh my goodness, if you've ever been to one of those homeless camps, uh, I'm surprised that there's not rampant uh, infections and, and rampant problems because of the sanitary, dissanitary conditions there. We really have to help those folks. We really have to do something uh, to incentivize them to come back into the system and not be in the homeless situation they're in. And those folks that are typically Thank have you. lost the job, time. have gotten into this. Uh, Thank you. Okay. And Charlotte Mena? Yeah, so I think when we talk about homelessness, uh, we have to understand that by definition, we're talking about a lot of different things. So there's what a lot of people think about, which is folks that we can see living in tents, you know, near the highway or the right of way or wherever in the city that may be. But by definition, this actually also includes people that are couch surfing or sleeping in their cars, it's families, it's working parents, I mean, homelessness looks very different. And I think the reasons for it are also very different, which is why it's so complicated to get a hold of. I think for the folks that are already unhoused, that have already lost their homes, we have to first and foremost approach this with humanity because poverty is not criminal. It's just not. And when we don't have enough housing units to house people, that is a failure of government. So that needs to be the way that we look at this the state has invested in rapid housing by purchasing old properties. We need to marry that with operating dollars so that people can get in there and get the services they need. We need permanent supportive housing so that if someone is trying to transition, they have the resources they need to do so successfully. Uh, and like I said, we need to do the prevention work as well, which is making sure that folks that still have their homes are able to stay in their homes. So this is not easy. This is gonna require a very concerted and intentional effort from the state the county and the city governments, and I'm prepared to uh, you know, work regionally to address this issue uh, with humanity. Thank you. This will be our last question. The responsibility of the police to the community has been a focus of legislative changes over the past two sessions. What changes, if any, would you support regarding current legislation 
about the police pursuit, use of force, and any other measures that are vital to the safety interests of people in your district. And we'll start with Terry, please. All right, thank you for that question. Uh, I've gone on a, a couple of ride-alongs and I asked them the exact question, you know, what, what do you guys uh, uh, do for you know, crime prevention? The explanation was, we need to change from probable cause back to reasonable suspicion for the pursuit law. Because right now, there are way too many situations where the police are simply not able to pursue what they know is a crime, such as a stolen car. There are situations where uh, the use of force obviously should have uh, 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 changed. We needed a, a little bit more accountability and they'll admit that themselves. However, it's gone a little bit too far to the point where you know, even pulling a car over for an obvious safety violation really is frowned upon, that it's not a major crime and they can't necessarily pursue them. So I would change that. So the police have a few more tools to go back, but not so much that they, you know, that those random police officers, the very few that want to abuse the system do. And those folks need to be held accountable. So 5919, Senate Bill 5919 should be passed and we should not let the clock run out on that one more time. Thank you. Thank you. David Figuration, please. I, I'd like to reiterate what Terry said. We, we, we need to change the law back to reasonable suspicion instead of probable cause. Too many times people are just committing crimes and they're just driving away and the police hands are tied because of the, the laws we passed in, in the legislature in this last session and the session before. We need to hold the police accountable, absolutely. When the police do something wrong, we need to hold them accountable. But at the same time, we can't tie their hands. We can't, we can't villainize them every time something happens. Um, and I, I think part of the problem with the, with the shortage in staffing at police departments right now are the ideas that the police don't feel like they're supported by the community or by the community leaders. And we need to change that to where they know we have their backs. At the same time, I agree with Charlotte on the uh, independent investigation. We need to look at those investigations. We need to investigate those. And, and we, need, we need to make sure that people are obeying the laws, police and non-police. One of the things that we, we hear all the time is these people are doing these things, but we don't, the cops are doing these things, but we don't hear about what caused the interaction in the first place. So we need to, we need to reform law back to the way it was before. Thank you. Thank you. And Charlotte Mena. Let me ask you now, if you don't mind, just to restate the question, if that's okay. Responsibility of the police to the community has been a focus of legislative changes over the past two sessions. What changes, if any, would you support regarding current legislation about police pursuit, use of force, and any other measures that are vital to the safety of people in your district? Excellent. Yeah, so as you all know, the legislature passed 12 accountability measures in 2021 from independent investigations to restricting the use of chokeholds, neck restraints, and tear gas. I think that these things make us all safer. I think the, uh, you know, the bill in question to restore vehicular pursuits did not pass because it did not have enough support from the people's representatives. The legislature did take action this year to uh, basically reinstate the use of non-lethal force, including beanbags and other such things. Um, but I think we really need to consider the fact that, you know, vehicular pursuits and lowering the bar for what would give you the authority to do that actually makes a lot of people less safe. I mean, there is evidence to suggest that vehicular pursuits are just not safe from a community standpoint or a bystander standpoint. So, you know, if that comes up again, I think we need to take a serious look at what we're asking for here and whether that helps us achieve the ultimate goal of keeping our communities safer. As I've mentioned before, we have a, you know, we have a painful history of gun violence in the 29th. Manny Ellis was killed 
in the heart of the 29th and we still don't have an answer for that. I think we need to be really conscious of the district we're representing who lives here and how we start to restore trust or build trust in many cases. Thank you. Thank you. And that was our last question. Now it's time for closing statements. We will use a reverse order from opening statements and we will start, and these will be one minute each uh, and we will start with David Figuration. Um, we need a fresh approach to, uh, to, to the problems that face the state. We've had 20 years of one party rule in Olympia and, and, and we see where we are now. So we need to look at how we're doing this. This is a policy question and it's how we approach problems. Do we approach problems with government fixes, with, with spending, or do we look at giving money back to the people and letting them decide what to do with it? Do we look at problems from a perspective of how, uh, how it affects a party or do we look at it as how it affects the individual? We need more individual approaches to problems and we need personal responsibility. People need to be held accountable for their actions. Thank you for your, your support, your, your putting this forum on. I really appreciate what the League of Women Voters does. Thank you. Thank you. Charlotte Mena. Yes, well, I echo that. Thank you so much for having us. This has been a wonderful forum. Uh, you know, I just, I'm really excited uh, to have the opportunity to get to work for the people of Washington State and in the 29th in particular. Um, we have a lot of urgent and pressing issues here, All, you know, many of which you asked about today, you know, safe communities, housing and homelessness, economics, supporting small businesses. And we're just not going to address these issues by misstating the facts or fear mongering. You know, we have not had one party rule in Olympia that implies that Democrats have been in control of both chambers of the legislature and the governor's office, which just simply wasn't the case until 2018. The reality is that 90% of the bills that pass in the legislature are bipartisan. I have experience working across the aisle. I bring with me professional experience as well as lived experience and the stories that I hear from people at the doors. And I'm ready to get to work in a really positive way that honors the values that we all share in the 29th. Thank you. Thank you. And Terry Harder. Well, again, thank you for this forum. Uh, I ask again, are you better off today than you were four years ago? Crime is up dramatically and the cost of living is way up and the schools are failing our children. Unless we change who we elect in November, we can expect more of the same. I simply ask for your support and for your vote. Thank you. Thank you for thank you all for your participation in this forum. Uh, thank you very much uh, to uh, candidate uh, for state senate Terry Harder, uh, candidate for house and candidates for house seat two Charlotte Mena and David Figuration. And thank you also to the nonpartisan co-sponsors of our forums, the AAUW of Puyallup and Tacoma, the Asian Pacific Cultural Center. Grid City Co-op, Latinos Unidos of South Sound, NAACP, the South End Neighborhood Council, the Summit Waller Community Association, Tacoma Pierce County Affordable Housing Consortium, Vibrant Schools, and the YWCA. Be sure to mail your ballots in before election day, November 8th, or put them in a drop box no later than 8 p.m. on election day, November 8th. Thank you again to the candidates for your participation. We very much appreciate it. And to the audience for being with us. Have a good day, everyone.